My name is Helene Gale, and I um, am the president and CEO of CARE, but in this context, I am a proud board member of New America. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce this next panel on national service and the next generation. My real role is to introduce the moderator, who is then going to introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, but let me just say a couple of words about why I'm so enthusiastic about this. Um, I have a career that has spanned service from government to philanthropy to uh, the not-for-profit and for-profit arena. And, you know, I think service is something we all talk about a lot about, and there's lots of different ways in which we can serve. But I think this panel is going to talk about it from a variety of different perspectives, and not only about a particular type of service and, and some of the initiatives that are going on around service, but also what does service mean to an individual? I always say that uh, while I uh, have been very pleased to be a servant in many ways and do public service in many ways, it also um, serves and gives back as well. And so as I think we talk about how, what does this mean, um, as far as service, what does it also mean in terms of what is it doing to develop us as a nation and our national character? So, they're going to say a lot more about it, but very enthusiastic about what I think will be an incredible panel. And let me just introduce our moderator today, who is Nicholas Thompson. Um, Nicholas is the editor of, the New, of NewYorker.com, where he oversees and manages the magazine's website. He is also a technology contributor to CBS and a co-founder of The Atavist, a software company and digital periodical um, that I think his first funder was actually, or one of his initial funders was Eric Schmidt. Um, he's also the author of The Hawk and the Dove, A History of the Cold War, which he wrote when he was a fellow uh, for New America. Uh, I understand he is also the longest or one of the longest uh, running fellows in New America. He obviously started at about the age of 13, 14, or 15, but he has uh, had a long uh, association with New America and has done an incredible amount of work during that time and since. So hand it off to Nicholas. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a great issue and we have an amazing panel. So we have Tulsi Gabbard. Um, she is a representative, a Democratic representative, come on stage from the 2nd Congressional District in Hawaii. She's one of the uh, first two female combat um, veterans to serve in Congress and the first Hindu member. We have Stan McChrystal. He is a former four-star general, uh, obviously ran all of our military operations in Afghanistan, chair of the McChrystal Group and chair of the Franklin Project, and he's also written a whole bunch of books, including one that is coming out now. And then we have Paul Montero, who is the director of America, AmeriCorps, and before that, yeah, Director of America, soon, soon, at the end of this panel, they will be one and the same. Um, he's the Director of AmeriCorps, and before that, he worked in the White House on outreach uh, to all sorts of interesting organizations. So if national service is going to be solved, it's going to be solved by a combination of politicians, activists, former military people. So here we are. Um, well, let's get going. So national service. Most everybody in this um, room probably agrees with it. It's something New America has been in favor of for a long time, but it's complicated. The politics are complicated. The politics have been persistent and persistent losses. I was sort of thinking about uh, Governor Kasich when he was talking about victory in politics, calling everybody over Thanksgiving weekend, calling, calling, and calling until he won. National service is one of those issues where they've been calling, 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 and not winning. Um, so let's get going, and by the end of this panel, we'll figure out a strategy to win. So let's start with you, Paul. National service, two words. They seem simple. They're both complicated. Um, what is service? Service uh, to AmeriCorps and all of the Corporation for National Community Service programs is um, adding value to a community, whether it's your own or another one. Um, many times our members are finding ways to help people at all, all different looking to find, be reconnected to the job, uh, job market. Um, services, using whatever talents or abilities or gifts you have to the benefit of others, whether they're your neighbors or not. And where do you draw the boundaries? I remember this, this is a debate, uh, I was a Truman Scholar, and right, it was given to people who would go into public service. And I was there, they decided they, it was supposed to fund your graduate careers. And when I was there, they decided they were going to stop giving it to people who were going to go to law school, because law wasn't service. Where do you draw the lines? What is not service? Well, I think that where the principal motivation is something other besides sort of building up and bolstering the community. Um, sort of predicated on the idea that 
about their rights, but their responsibilities, what they owe to the mm -hmm. community they're a part of um, or the community they live in. Um, I think where, where that service is motivated by something other than that desire to help, um, then it may be something else, a profit motive, X, Y, and Z. But uh, service um, takes many different forms. I think, again, where it's sort of the target of the activity or the target of the um, actions uh, is either inward focused or uh, driven by some sort of monetary benefit or, or some other, uh, other benefits to the person themselves. Mm -hmm. That's when I think it's more focused on an, an individual as opposed to the broader community. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Well, Stan, let's go to the um, this other word, national. When you think about service and you think of it in a national context, what does that mean? I mean, military is national service. You're protecting the nation. But the other things that we talk about when we think about national service aren't national. AmeriCorps is, is it national? Like, what, is, what does the national part of national service mean to you? Um, and while you're at it, tell us a little bit about your Franklin Project. Sure. I, I think first, service, I agree with Paul. Service is the idea you're contributing to something bigger than yourself. I tie the idea of national service to the responsibility of citizenship. You mm -hmm. may perform your service very locally. It may affect people in a very small area, but it is a commitment to the idea that citizenship is more than just a set of entitlements and a limited number of voting and paying taxes. So it's a more organic relationships. So in my view, what we are trying to do with national service is create the idea that for a period of your life, and the Franklin Project's goal is to create a service year for every young American to do a year of full-time paid national service the idea being that the work that they do would be of value, but the real payoff is the change you make in the people who do it. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency to, to want to say, well, we need more uh, roads and parks, so we'll have people do that. We can hire people for that if we right. want to. What we really are trying to do is create citizens who are going to vote at a higher rate, who are going to have a habit of service for the rest of their lives, who are going to feel as though they have a responsibility not to some uh, inanimate thing of a nation, but to other, other citizens. So, th so the exact proposal is to fund how many people doing how many things? There are about four million young people in every cohort, each year group. And best case, every young person sometime between the age of 18 and 28 would do a full year. Mm -hmm. Our near-term goal is to get to one million, and we're about 200,000 right now. And the idea, the concept, is that military and civilian service are really two sides of the same coin. Yep. They are contributions, and so we ought to honor and respect them the same, mm -hmm. but we ought to create opportunities so that at least a million kids can do it, because we believe that when you get to 25% of a year group, suddenly national service won't be something different. You'll hear it at the lunch table. You'll hear it at the table at home. Enough of your friends will do it. Well, that will start to be that cultural expectation. Wait, that's, there's a super interesting uh, point you just made, which is that military and civilian service should be treated the same. So should somebody who finishes AmeriCorps be able to use a VA hospital? Should they be given the same benefits that military veterans are given? In my opinion, we ought to look at all of the benefits that we do, from financial to other things, and we ought to to look at service so that we give it. Now, there's, there could be a certain, if you do one year in one thing, it might not be the same as doing more years in something else, but there ought to be a benefit, a respect and a benefit for everyone who does service, I believe strongly. Okay, Congressman Gabbard, do you agree with this, this plan? And also tell me what you think national service means to you. Yeah, I think uh, when you look at uh, both Paul and Stan's comments really about what is the meaning of service, uh, and, and really, what, what does it mean to have servant leaders? Mm -hmm. And why is it important in our society? And, and the point that you brought up about the boundaries, mm -hmm. that there really are no boundaries, that when we look at the, the actions that we take, each of us in our different sectors, whether it's in business, um, in politics, in the military, in law enforcement, every single sector in journalism, uh, it really does go to the motivation mm -hmm. and how you will use your um, skills and your actions in a way that positively impacts other people. Uh, and you see a difference. When you see people or meet people or hear from people who have had that experience in their lives where they've dedicated a certain portion of their time and energy uh, to make that positive impact on other people, um, you get a different perspective. But I, I, this, is, this is leading me back to the question of lines again. So let me give you a specific example. Let's say I'm 21 years old, I really want to do national service. I, really, you know, I just want to save the environment. I care about it so passionately that what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out there and I'm going to sink whaling ships, right? Is that okay? No. <laughs> but why not? Sounds illegal. 
I mean, it's, it's outside of me. I'm out there and protecting the whales and protecting the environment. You know, where, where do we... Also causing harm to people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I think there, there's a common sense element that has to be brought into the or conversation Maybe whaling here. ship sinking is a little <laughs> excessive, but let's say I'm going to U-lock myself in front of a bulldozer, in front of a forest. Yeah. Well, you know, diff different people will take um, uh, different forms of activism, right, to achieve their end goal, and sometimes it is to spark the conversation. Uh, I think we saw a lot of this through um, through the Occupy movement, mm -hmm. uh, where people were really raising their voices and raising the conversation to say, hey, look, there is a huge constituency of people here who uh, really are, are not being heard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've seen that also recently with a lot of the um, law enforcement issues that are being brought up, criminal justice reform issues that are being brought up. Uh, so keeping that focus on the motivation of, of how are you serving um, the greater good and make, mm -hmm. making ultimately a positive impact. Let's take this question to maybe the other side of the political spectrum, Paul, something you worked on in the White House. Let's say I decide that I really want to do national service, but it's all through my religion. And I'm, I'm a Catholic or I'm, and it involves I can only work with other Catholics um, because for whatever reason, or I can only work with other members of this religion. How does that tie into national service and how does America deal with those issues? Well, there's certainly a tie in. I think one of the things that's made our country, you know, what it is is sort of the, Ben Franklin started the first volunteer organization in Philadelphia with the Volunteer Fire Department. Since the beginning of the country, that sort of sense of mission and that sense of obligation to help the broader community and faith-based organizations have been at the front line of that since we started as a country. And so what you're seeing now is this really interesting phenomena where established religious denominations for different reasons, you see membership declining. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when you come to millennials, um, choosing to live out their faith in a way that may be different from the way their parents did. And service is one of the alternate routes that you see sort of really thriving. So as the institutional sort of membership declines, you see the growth of these other service organizations motivated by uh, religious belief and saying that uh, whatever I believe, whether it's uh, I'm a Catholic or I'm a Hindu or I'm a Muslim or I'm a uh, secular humanist, I'm a, just a, I, I want to be a moral person. You're finding a lot of the meat through service. The president started the uh, campus interfaith challenge a few years ago, just saying, on a college campus, all of these student groups set up by religious identity are serving. They're doing community service at a mm -hmm. food bank, cleaning up a river or a park. Why not serve together as opposed to in your different silos? And th the sort of obliquely come to the conversation about what do you believe, what do I believe, but really meeting through service. So you, would you directly give money to churches? Uh, no, we, we, faith-based organizations that focus on service. We, obviously, they have the bright lines of we're not giving taxpayer money to proselytize. We're not using taxpayer uh, money to uh, convert or mm -hmm. spread any particular uh, religious message. Um, but, uh, you know, it's an established sort of balance between the government and faith-based organizations where um, it's not crossing any lines to have a soup kitchen with a cross on the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not violating any, anything. So, um, Stan, let me ask you a, a pretty core question here, which is that this is going to work. If we can get everybody to do it, we really should get everybody to do it. It should be compulsory, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, I grew up in a mandatory world. Uh, but the reality is it's hard to sell people on a mandatory idea right now. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to create a cultural expectation so that we believe that if we make it voluntary but expected, that at a certain point we can get enough peer pressure, societal pressure, norms, and build in some incentives for people. Mm -hmm. Things like there's a, uh, an organization or a uh, qualification we've done called Employers for National Service. And what we've done, gotten 190 companies to sign up, and they are stating that they value national service. So if young people who are want to serve, but then they also know that there's going to be some advantage for them in getting a job or getting into a university, then we're reinforcing ideas that they already have. But to really make it national, to really make it something that brings the country together, it should be something that everybody does, right? Shouldn't, it be, shouldn't we force every group to do it? Force and give incentives? I think when you use the word force, okay, maybe force is the wrong service. word. <clears throat> Imprison anybody who doesn't. <laughs> I, when you look at, you know, having an attitude of service, when you look at people who are exhibiting service, uh, servant leadership qualities, it goes to your motivation and really what's in your heart. 
-hmm. So I think when you're talking about forced service, to me, it's a little bit of an oxymoron, which goes to what Stan's talking about is you, you, it, it does go to a culture change and it takes time and it takes investment and it takes buy-in, not just government is forcing you, you must do this because that, frankly, to me, would not achieve the outcome that we're hoping for. But it could be a requirement, like the military used to be a requirement. Paul, do you, let's, you, do you believe in compulsory national service? You know, I think the challenge now is that even with all of our programs, all AmeriCorps programs, Senior Corps, you have so many folks that want to serve, we just don't have enough spots for them. We have far yeah. more applications than we have spots. That's why it's great to see Franklin Project and others sort of creating pathways for people who want to serve. Sort of the world we live in right now is um, there's certainly demand. There's not enough op opportunities to sort of uh, do that. And so our 80,000 members across the country certainly do that. But for the many that don't make it in, where, where do they go? And really creating opportunities for folks who have raised their hand and say, I want to serve some way. Um, what opportunities are there for them? So I, as opposed to the conversation about pushing people to do anything, yeah. I think where we are right now is a lot of people are raising their hands. Um, we just don't we need more pathways for them to serve. So let's say we could come up with, this is a question for any of you, we could come up with a wish list of all the things we could do to bring people into national service, the incentives. So you're obviously starting a database to match people with the right jobs. You've talked about college credit, college grants. There's been talk about hiring preferences for people who complete this, sort of the, the same level of respect you get in society if you join the military. What are some of the other things on the wish list? I think society can do it. When mm -hmm. a young person wants to run for Congress, society can ask, where did you serve? What did you do? And if there's a deafening silence, then I think that creates a pressure. I think there are a number of informal things, expectations that we can create. We can demand of ourselves and demand of each other that, that are pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think the employers and national service piece is showing how states like Virginia and Montana and others, how cities like Philadelphia are saying people that serve in national service programs have the criteria, the, the, the skill set, the attitude, the ability to work with folks different from themselves that we value in our organization. Uh, mm -hmm. Companies like Disney and Comcast and others saying that's exactly the type of uh, person we want in our company or nonprofit or in our state government. So uh, you already start to see people glomming onto this idea that um, there's a value, there's a practical value to the experience of national service that we want to seize and uh, to the benefit of our respective organization. Besides um, increasing funding for AmeriCorps, are there things uh, up for debate in Congress that could draw more people in or help meet the supply of these jobs, meet the demand? I think more funding in Congress for anything is a tough conversation uh, to have, but as we look to how we're investing um, uh, in our future, AmeriCorps is a great example, there are others <coughs> Um, that I think we have to look at how we're leveraging whatever government resources are put mm -hmm. out there, whether it's through specific agencies or otherwise, uh, with private sector investment, mm -hmm. um, you know, which has to be part of that. As, as you're, you're changing this culture and the expectation from individuals, I think also there can be kind of a brand of service that can be attached to whether it's small businesses, educational institutions, large corporations who are really invested and bought into this. So in preparation for this panel, I thought, what did, what did I do the year after college? So what I did the year after college is I got hired at a really good corporate job and got fired on the first day. Then I went to Africa and got kidnapped. Mm -hmm. And then I became a street musician in New York. So I didn't do anything for anybody. It was pretty useless, right? But actually, set of pretty valuable experiences. Um, how much do you worry that you know, <coughs> really creating cultural expectation that people go into City or in AmeriCorps that you're taking away for a lot of people a sort of period of experimentation, which actually is also a really good moment for becoming an adult? Yeah, I, I would challenge that. I would say that whether it's before college or before a job if they're not going to go to university or after, that the experience of going to work in City Year or AmeriCorps somewhere, working in a school in New Orleans or or somewhere else is probably a life experience that's hard to compete yeah. with the traditional travel around gap year or whatever. I think it's just that much richer. And the fact that you would interact with people not from your zip code, not from your background. Well, is I got kidnapped, I was definitely interacting with but <laughs> <laughs> digress. Yeah. Um, it, it probably is more critical than anything else that we give people this chance to step away from what they're going to do. I teach now, and one of the great things, problems I find is as young people get near graduation, there's this implied pressure to get into the workforce, not to fall a step behind, not yeah. to turn down a uh, job offer from a prestigious company because it might not be there next year. 
And that's the kind of thing with employers of national service. We want them to guarantee. If Goldman Sachs gives a young person at Yale that I teach mm -hmm. an offer, what we'd like them to do is say, yep, we'll hire you and we'll see you 12 months from now as soon as you finish your national service, but your job is guaranteed as long as you finish. Uh, we've got cultural expectations to get in the race and hurry and not fall behind. And then I'd also remind you that the vast majority of young Americans can't take a gap year. Mm -hmm. They can't afford it. And so they've got to get on to life. So giving them a fully paid opportunity for a year allows them to have this kind of enriching experience and then go into whatever they're going to do. Would you also mandate that somebody who's hired at Goldman Sachs, who works there a couple years but hasn't yet turned 28, has the opportunity to step out for a year and then come back? I would like, if they had not done service, I would yeah. very much like to see that. And I would think that very open-minded employers that can afford it would give that opportunity because they're going to get back a better person. Tufts has implemented this one plus four program where you apply to Tufts and your first year you do service and the next four you do regular education. They are banking that those young people that do that are going to come in as much better freshmen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's absolutely right. If I, if I had done a year anywhere before I went to West Point, I would have been a better cadet. <laughs> I could not have been a worse cadet. <laughs> Well, that's one of the ways we're growing is sort of the, the public-private partnership. Like uh, we're, companies like City, you know, um, City have uh, through their foundation. Uh, that's our largest partnership where we have hundreds of vistas working on financial literacy um, and using City employees as mentors with a lot of these young people. And, and same with Google, Google uh, sort of our code core, um, Google and Boys and Girls Club sort of helping low-income children learn how the basics of coding. Um, and using Google employees as some of the mentors, instructors. Yeah. Um, so th th you're seeing organizations, companies saying there's actually a value to providing that pathway for our employees. They come back, you know, they're, they're invested in the mission, they're productive, and they enjoy service. So last night I also went through um, quotes that different presidents have said about national service. So Bill Clinton, 100th day in office, national service will mark the start of a new era for America in which every citizen, every one of you can become an agent of change. John McCain in, uh, in 2001, this is how a free society remains free and achieves greatness. National service is a crucial means of making our patriotism real to the benefit of ourselves and our country. George W. Bush, my call tonight is for every American to commit at least two years, 4,000 hours over the rest of your lifetime to the service of your neighbors and your nation. Barack Obama to in a similar degree. Why haven't we had this happen? Well, I, I would argue it's pretty clear. What, what's happened in America is we're like a deer caught in the headlights. We look at every problem now and we stare at it and we say it's too high, too dark, too wide, too expensive, too something. We can't do it. I, I would argue that we couldn't build the Boulder Dam now. We couldn't do the interstate highway uh, system that's been so valuable for us because every big problem looks too difficult, too daunting. There'd be no Panama Canal if we had to start it now. And so what we need to ask is just a binary question. Has citizenship deteriorated in America? And I think the answer is yes. Would national service improve that demonstrably? And I, of course, think yes. Then the answer is not whether we do it, it's how. Mm -hmm. And I think that we let ourselves sort of get treated by chihuahuas on this. Um, <laughs> we, we have really got to just make this is a fundamental big issue, big question a big idea. It's not an incremental thing, 5,000 more slots for this. It's a cultural change in America that America's got to stand up and say, we've got to fix it. And this is the moment, isn't it, right? We're presidential campaigns. That's where we debate these things. So how do we get this into the presidential campaign? By doing more things like this, mm -hmm. by uh, increasing the conversation, increasing the accountability, not only asking the questions of college students, but asking the questions of our country's leaders, both for themselves and their own experiences, but also uh, what their actions and, and their plans would be to do this. Because as, as you mentioned, Stan, this isn't about how much good one person can do in a year, but really how that experience changes that individual going forward. Uh, I, I met recently with a, someone who uh, lives in Hawaii who had uh, participated in Teach for America. Completely changed his life. He decided to continue teaching, but has continued to be a great advocate in mentorship and gathering more people and getting more people into that program because without it, he would have gone down a completely different path. Mm -hmm. Is this the right moment? Should we be thinking big ideas, or should we be focusing on, for example, the fact that Congressman keeps cutting AmeriCorps' budget to zero, and then the Senate keeps saving it, and now the Senate has flipped hands? So is this a moment where we need to prevent bad things from happening, or a moment to push for big things? I think this is the moment to push for big things, and the program I run, Vista, is turning 50 this year. Mm -hmm. um, and the flip side of turning 50, as I was saying backstage, is you're, you're 50 
years old, and how have you changed as the country's changed since 1965? Um, and I think that it's, it's a moment to sort of take stock of, you know, for the 190,000 people that have served in VISTA over the course of 50 years, the common refrain you hear, whether it's Senator Rockefeller who just retired or Gwen Moore in the Congress, sort of, they served as a VISTA and never stopped serving. It's a transformative experience. And in VISTA, you're paid a stipend that's tied to the poverty line. So you, you basically commit to living in poverty for one year. But even with that, it was one of the best years of their entire life, and it set them on a pathway that they never really deviated from. They just found other ways to serve. And so why not ask that question about how, how do you create other pathways knowing it is a year of sacrifice, but it transforms your whole outlook on yourself and the community. But what can be done with Congress? Why does Congress keep voting to defund you? I think that, uh, you know, I've got to be careful about answering that question. Congresswoman yeah. Gabbard here. <laughs> Congresswoman here, but uh, I, I think to some degree, there is a moment where folks are arguing about what is the proper role of government. And it's a fair, you know, obviously question to ask. Um, I think that to some degree we're caught up in that. Um, but I, I, I like to tell every person that I meet, you know, show me another government program. And I'm just for AmeriCorps VISTA. You give us $94 million every year for about 7,500 VISTAs. In one fiscal year, they generate $170 million for the nonprofits they serve in, you serve in writing grants, doing fundraising. It's a great leveraging of the federal dollar to the sector you say should be carrying the load. Um, and so showing the, the return on the investment, this is a great leveraging of a federal investment that works to the benefit of communities. Um, and so it's a program that I think more should love if they knew sort of the, the, the return on the investment that we get. But I think, you know, I think it goes to uh, some larger issues. I think that's a very good one. It goes to a larger <coughs> issue of uh, take your pick on the issue that's before Congress. Um, the response very often comes to, well, what do we have to do just to get us to the next year? Or what do we have to do just to get us to the next six months? The, the least minimum. So if you're talking about visionary ideas, big ideas, investing in the future, unfortunately, there's very little of that happening in Congress, period, on any issue. Uh, I think the second thing um, that has to do with that bigger problem, but has to do with uh, what you're talking about here is, um, there is no f full, complete government solution to this, and government should not be the answer to um, this question of service or everything. And if we expect government to change, if we expect elected officials to be responsive to um, their constituencies, their constituencies have to be calling for this. They have to say, this is the impact that these programs are making in our community. We are uh, expecting for there to be opportunities um, these pathways into national service, uh, and there has to be that return on investment that's proven and shown, uh, whether it's through nonprofits, through the private sector, where you're showing. If you're paying 5,000 taxpayer dollars for something, you're leveraging this many times return uh, for that investment. All right, Congress may not be the place for big ideas, big questions, and forward thinking, but a New America lunch is. So, uh, Q&A, please. Emery. Hi, so this is, this is uh, wonderful stuff, and particularly the framing of responsible citizenship. My question is, what about elders? We spent the morning talking about how uh, boom, re the elder boom, retiring baby boomers, many of whom will have 10 to 15 years of active life still ahead of them, uh, and is there a role for someone who uh, didn't, couldn't afford to do service beforehand uh, to do a year of service now, and what would that mean for multi-generational interaction? Take it. Great question. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a great question, Emory. Um, there is a rule for elders, but the, the project, the Franklin Project, is focused on young people because what we're trying to do is produce people who in later years will do that reflexively. When they retire, they'll do it and they'll volunteer. What we're trying to do is affect the concept of citizenship during that critical window between 18 and 28 when most people have the freedom. They don't yet have a spouse, they don't have a mortgage, they don't have a dog and that sort of thing. So we're allowing them to do things during that period. But, but clearly, I think that would be part of the product. Get them in the pre-dog years, very important. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I probably have a couple questions. So first, and, and uh, Paul, you alluded to it a little bit in, in one of your comments about this next generation is the generation that wants to do their own thing. And so, you know, we talk a lot about entrepreneurship. Some people think 
service and entrepreneurship are almost at opposite ends of the spectrum. You're talking about going out and doing for others and doing something oftentimes that's involved with an ongoing organization. So in your, in any of you, in, in your thinking about this and in talking to young people, has that been a challenge, the getting people to think not about what I'm going to do and the organization I'm going to build, but to be part of uh, existing organizations. And the second one, you know, when we think about this as the future and the next generation and national service in an ever more global world, should we be thinking about service beyond our borders, Peace Corps, uh, as well as VISTA? So, you know, how, how should we be thinking about that too as we, we try to change the character of our nation and thinking more globally? So, either of those, any of you for either of those. Wow. Yeah, I would love to jump in on that one. I think, and when I use this sort of generation of service, I do include the sort of the 10,000, I think it is, baby boomers that are retiring every day. They can only play so much golf or paint so much. They, have a, they still have a sense of mission. They want to serve. I think they would be perfect members for our program. And for those that are maybe on the early side of their career, thinking about being a social entrepreneur or whatever, or whatever else, I think consider for VISTA, you're embedded in a nonprofit organization for one year, seeing what it takes to grow it, to sustain it, to bolster its capacity to serve more people. Uh, if you're thinking about building your own nonprofit one day, it's, to me, school for social entrepreneurs and, and seeing the, the way that we take a good model and scale it up um, in a sustainable way so that when the VISTA leaves, that nonprofit can continue to grow. Um, I think that we're looking to build opportunities with our senior core colleagues saying, for the folks that still have a lot left to give, to a whole sort of body of work they're sitting on as retirees, that you can you know, sort of share with a younger person maybe coming out of college. There's so many opportunities for us to work together as the foster grandparent program turns 50 years old this year too. What about expanding beyond our borders? I, I would say that beyond our borders is something that the Franklin Project includes already. The Peace Corps is one of our partners in it. I think the concept of service, wherever you do it, you know, national seems to limit it because in fact it's local, it's national, and it's international. The idea, again, is what it does for that young person when they're through with it. Peace Corps volunteers, look what they do in society after that experience. So we very much believe it can be sort of anywhere as long as it's focused on something that expands your sense. Other questions in the room? Yes, please. Uh, I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer, so I get the service thing. And now I'm a Fed. Uh, this morning I was at the first meeting of an interagency group the Broadband Opportunity Council. And we're looking at promoting broadband adoption, which I think everybody agrees is, is critical for us as a society and nation to advance. I'm, I'm familiar with VISTA volunteers in Boston, VISTA volunteers in uh, Minneapolis, doing things on digital literacy, digital inclusion. But does AmeriCorps VISTA have a national program where you know you might focus it on broadband adoption and digital literacy training and, and do sort of a national focus on rural areas or tribal nations? We do have certain projects in states that, that focus on that issue. I, I was just in Mississippi a few weeks ago and um, that's a challenge where many of their, I was talking to someone from the Library Commission and most libraries in the state of Mississippi are on dial-up um, and some rural areas there is no connection um, and sort of looking to, to build a system there. Um, the thing about VISTA, sort of based on the Peace Corps model, where we were established as the domestic version of the Peace Corps, sort of it's, it's finding what does the local community say it needs, and then putting in the VISTA human capital to run with that, as opposed to imposing sort of our national blueprint on this is the answer to your problems in any town yeah. USA, which I think is one of the reasons we have, we've had the success uh, the program's had in 50 years. It's sort of the community knows what it, it needs. It's, it doesn't need the sort of federal government coming in and saying this is... <laughs> sort of the blueprint. Um, so, to an, sorry, to answer your question, yes, we do have projects focused on that, trying to move into the sort of uh, technology space, given the world is very different than it was in 1965. Um, and that's one area that can really provide access and opportunity for low-income young people uh, to learn more, you know, online education, X, Y, and Z. All right, so we have time for a couple more questions right here in the front, please. Good to see you again. Good to see you, so We should probably wait for the mic for the uh, services of our web viewers. One of the things you talk about is public service, but after the fact, not that many people realize that you're teaching a class up at Yale on leadership. 
Admiral McRaven now is the chancellor at the University of Texas, a former SOCOM commander. Admiral Olson, former SOCOM commander, is teaching a class at Columbia. Admiral Stravitas, the former SACUR, is teaching a class at, uh, at, at, at Tufts. In terms of what that brings to the table of your role's influence on students that you have in your classes, how do you see that as a multiplier of supporting national service? I, I think anything you can do to expose young people to the concept of service is really powerful. You know, for many years, I teach at Yale. For many years, Yale, because of their opinion on the Vietnam War, didn't have ROTC, and then because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, didn't have it for about 40 years. And so there was a very tiny representation of Yale graduates in the military. I had met one in my entire Army career. Since I've been up there, ROTC's come, not because of me, but ROTC has come back. We're starting to see people go. The young man who, a Yale graduate who worked with me for two and a half years my, my, writing my memoirs, did an amazing job on it, lived with my wife and I for a good percentage of that. And then at 28 years old, after having been exposed to the culture of it, he enlisted. And he's now a specialist, an E4, uh, in 2nd Ranger Battalion. So when you are exposed to people who have served and the concept of service, it is. It's contagious. And so I think that whenever we can get people who served in any, in any sense back into places where people are making those decisions, into schools, into elementary schools, into everything and around dinner tables, then I think you can do it. I went into the Army because my father and grandfather had, not because I wanted to serve. It just seemed like the thing. Um, in the back. Hi, my question actually um, speaks to what the previous gentleman just spoke on and what you just um, responded to as far as exposure. And so um, I wanted to find out, do you all have kind of a um, revved up initiative, like a preparatory initiative for the school system in that um, maybe the guidance counselors can, you know, get more acclimated to the idea of serving. And so when you do have that rare student every now and then that comes and says, you know, I think I want to serve, um, that guidance counselor is equipped with the resources to give to them so that they're able to get their families prepared and you know you're not shocking your mom and dad by saying hey when I graduate high school I still want to go to college but I also want to serve I want to volunteer so that's my question um, well for our program VISA used to have on-campus recruiting um, uh, that was sort of a victim I think of budget realities and, and we no longer have them we work with our colleagues at Peace Corps to sort of piggyback off of their outreach Funny, I just spoke at my high school this week at their career day. Um, I, I've been out of high school for many years. I, people wonder about exactly how old I am. Um, but I went back for career day, and the guidance counselors had never heard of AmeriCorps. They had never heard of it. They, they've heard of our grantees. They've heard of Teach for America. They've heard of Habitat for Humanity. They've heard of Catholic Charities. They haven't so much heard of AmeriCorps. And so we're looking, obviously digital is one way to get the word out, but again, there are many parts of the country where folks are just not online or can't get online or don't have a smartphone. And that's a tougher nut to crack, but we're actually looking at how we can steer more effort to focus on that question, because if, if they've never heard of it, you know, it's a non-starter. Um, so that is a problem. I think we need to do that. I also would, would even take a step further. We should have single recruiting centers. Right now, you can go to an Army or an Air Force or Navy or whatever. You ought to go to one recruiting center that does everything from AmeriCorps Peace Corps, the Army, Navy, all of those, so that when a young person walks in, because only about a third of young people in America are qualified to enlist in the military for physical or other reasons. But everybody ought to be able to, there ought to be a digital version, but also a physical version. You go in, and if you don't like the look of one thing, there are other options right there, almost like a supermarket where you shop. Plus, it would be vastly more efficient. I mean, we could do all of the things of automation and whatnot that would just make it really, really effective, and we need to get over some of these siloed efforts uh, at things like this. Um, last question, up here in the front. Hi. Uh, in Europe, there have been for about 20 years a similar program to what you described, and in its original version, it had something very interesting that was after the 12 months you spent, in that case abroad, you could be getting some seed money, which was not too little at the time, to create your own project. <coughs> And do you have anything like this? Because that would multiply the effect enormously. Thank you. That's a great idea. Well, I mean, for AmeriCorps, obviously, the, the sort of uh, carrot at the end of your year of service is the Siegel Education Award. And many of our members 
it tracks the Pell Grant, so it's about $5,600 you can use to further your education, pay off a loan, um, or a cash version of it, a little less, to sort of make that next move in life. Many times our members are hired by the nonprofits they served in, and for Vista, just like Peace Corps, um, you have non-competitive eligibility. Um, it's sort of, uh, you're considered a federal employee for the purposes of hiring, so many times it's a pathway into federal service. Um, so there, there are benefits of that sort. Um, uh, and, and we have many nonprofit sponsors. Again, we, they refer to Vista as the seed capital because we help scale. And we, as we're celebrating 50 years, we look back at so many nonprofits that can say, we wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for the seed capital that Vista was at the beginning of it. So, um, and, and then the benefits of sort of a health benefit, a education award, and things like that. All right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to a fantastic panel with big ideas. And they've all, all people who have committed their lives to this idea. So uh, delighted to be on stage with all of you. It was an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you.